There's no plan B. Uh, we've been told that time and time again. Uh, we first heard there was no plan B from Jane Calvert of the union representing forestry and timber workers, the CFMEU, a key player in the Tasmanian Forest Agreement issue. The Federal Environment Minister, Tony Burke, used the term when he briefed us last Wednesday. We heard it today from uh, Taran. Plan B, none. If the bill's not passed, there's been too much deferment and they'll shut down. But plan B, that's the phrase that stuck in my mind and led me to think deeply about a possible plan B. But I'm no expert on the forestry industry. I spoke to many people in the industry and eventually came to the conclusion that any plan B meant going back to where we were, watching an industry continue to decline, continue to lose jobs and continue to be excluded from world markets, continue to split the Tasmanian community. Madam President, we've seen that for at least the past 30 years. I uh, find it important in considering issues like this one to keep an open mind from the very beginning of the public debate. If I tell the public how I intend to vote at the beginning of the process, half of them will write me off and they won't bother to send me their views. For example, if I would uh, declared my opposition to the Tasmanian Forest Agreement from the start, many of those who supported it wouldn't bother to lobby me and I would have received a skewed impression of public perceptions. Half of my electorate would have written me off. And of course, vice versa. And in any case, Madam President, it's important for me to hear from the community, to listen to the briefings and some of the debate before making up my mind. Since the state opposition made their commitment to tear up the intergovernmental agreement some months ago, there have been significant developments, as we all know. Whatever I may have thought about the Tasmanian Government Agreement or the Tasmanian Forestry Agreement at the 11th hour, after 30 months of negotiations, the forestry industry, the main union and the NGOs have made substantial compromises and reached an agreement. And I bow to their judgment. They know the industry far better than I do. I feel if you disagree with their judgment and oppose this bill, you're obligated to explain your plan B. I have no plan B, and I'm therefore inclined to support the agreement, because I don't want to see Tasmania go back to where we were before. I don't want to go back to the forest wars, which have split communities and families. I don't want to go back to the days, well, the decades, of massive subsidies to keep an ailing industry going. I don't want to go back to the lack of transparency regarding prices paid for the taxpayers' forest resource, to the total confusion of where the forestry industry is heading. I don't want to go back to the time when forestry and tourism were in apparent conflict. But Madam President, if anyone can come up with a plan B, an alternative plan for the Tasmanian forestry industry, and for the protection of places like the Styx and the Florentine Valleys, and if they can demonstrate that they have the support of the main players, the industry, the CFMEU and the NGOs, then I would tend to vote with them. That is, of course, highly unlikely at this stage, Madam President. Thanks. Thank you, Member Familiar. If uh, this House rejects this bill without a viable alternative, it will be negating more than two years of intensive negotiation. It will be rejecting federal funding for regional development and the further restructuring of the forestry industry. 
If we reject this bill, Madam President, we'll be telling the forestry industry that we know better, that we know more about the forestry industry and its problems than they do. That's a worrying prospect. My electorate on the West Tamer has only a small forestry industry, but many of my electors are very interested in the future of a Tasmanian industry, and I've been at pains to listen to their views. I've received plenty of emails, because I haven't taken a public position on this bill and have demonstrated an open mind, I have received emails from both sides of the argument, roughly 50-50, for and against. I think the balance might have changed somewhat in, uh, in uh, recent days with the majority of messages coming from uh, employees or people connected with Ta'an, and they're supporting the TFA. I suggest, Madam President, that those who have declared a firm view, either for or against, early in the process, will receive a distorted view of public attitudes. If you declare that you're implacably opposed to the TFA, then those who back it will write you off. If you say you're all for it, most of those who oppose the agreement will not bother with you. So if there is a public perception of how you intend to vote, half of the argument will potentially ignore you. Madam President, what will Tasmania lose if we reject this agreement on the future of forestry? Well, for a start, a substantial amount for regional development, desperately needed from the forestry industry. The figure at the moment is $96 million. We would lose the remaining $15 million for payouts to contractors for restructuring. We would lose the index $7 million a year to help manage forest reserves under the IGA. If there are other potential Commonwealth funding losses, um, I believe I'm OK to speak, uh, Leader and uh, Madam President, about, about, the, about the money today. The extra funding, sorry. No, on the 6 o'clock news, well, it must be OK to release. OK. ABC, of course. Um, but, of course, that's, uh, that's another $102 million that will not come. We will have wasted 30 months of extensive negotiations. A northern plywood mill, valued at about $10 million, promised by Ta'an last Wednesday, will not go ahead. And it's highly likely that Ta'an will leave the state. If that happened, Madam President, Tasmanian private landholders would lose an opportunity to supply as many as 140,000 cubic metres of peeler billets a year to Ta'an to make up the 160,000 cubic metres it needs. And it's possible Tasmania would lose a potential share in carbon credits. I'll leave that to the member for Romney to explain about carbon credits, knowing his dedicated interest in the subject. Credit where credit's due. <laughs> and uh, above all, Madam President, we would lose even more export markets because of uncertainty and a lack of confidence in the Tasmanian industry, not to mention intensifying protest action. We were told last week at the Tehran briefing that the company had lost markets in the UK and Europe because of the publicity, the bad publicity by conservationists. We were told in no uncertain terms that without the agreement, Tehran will pull out of Tasmania. That's as recently as the briefing today. Also, we were told, Madam President, of the potential benefits if Tehran stayed in Tasmania in an atmosphere of security and certainty. That briefing, Madam President, also attended by ENGO representatives, to me was very convincing. I was amazed to see conservationists sharing a public forum with a major player in the forestry industry. To me, that bodes well for the future. The National Director of the Wilderness Society, Lyndon Schneiders, was one of those present. I just want to quote, Madam President, from an article that uh, Mr Schneiders wrote for the Australian newspaper last month. More than the forest or the timber industry, it is the Tasmanian community 
and Tasmanian economy that most desperately needed the forest peace agreement that has been reached between environment groups, union and industry. For it is the Tasmanian community split asunder for years by the battle for forests that has been affected most by this debate. The scars are deep and the uncertainty and constant political heat around this issue have created a serious dent in investor confidence in the state and cast a shadow over the prospects for sustainable economic growth and opportunity. It is for these reasons, not just for the forests or the workers, that the agreement now needs political support to give Tasmania a new start. The fate of this agreement now rests on the shoulders of the independent members of the Tasmanian Upper House who have the power to bring it to life. That was from the Australian 24th of November. It's hard to realise, Madam President, just how intense is the international scrutiny of Tasmania's forestry industry. Anyone, anywhere in the world with internet access can watch Miranda Gibson sitting 60 metres up the observatory. Likewise, any other forest protests. Potential buyers of Tasmanian forest products can use Google Earth to zoom into areas where products are likely to be harvested. They can evaluate the effects of clear felling for themselves. And of course, Madam President, we in this House are under intense scrutiny as we debate this bill. It's just as easy for potential buyers in Japan, South Korea and China to watch this debate live as it is for Tasmanians. Now all these observers, Madam President, can judge for themselves what happens in the harvesting of the products that they might buy. If they see protests, if Google Earth shows them environmental damage, if they see a lack of political will to, support out the Tasmanian, to sort out the Tasmanian forestry conflict, they will buy their forest products elsewhere. And there is evidence that they're doing just that. This TFA agreement on the future of Tasmania's forestry industry has 11 signatures confirming the agreement. Some of them were arch enemies previously. They have signed now without reservation. This is the agreement, it states. We have signed it, you might listen to this member for Windermere, and will not resile from it. Regardless of your view of the TFA, this is an historic document. Madam President, uh, there has been some talk about amendments to this bill, but as we heard from the Premier, so long as the thrust of the agreement is not changed uh, the, and enhances the bill, the government is likely to agree. But uh, some issues appear to be a matter for um, legislation in future negotiation. The bill, of course, is not very specific on the cut-up of resources and leaving that to later negotiation and uh, regulation. And, Madam President, uh, much has been made of the reduction from the current statutory minimum of 300,000 cubic metres of high quality saw logs from public forest to the minimum of 137,000 cubic metres under the Tasmanian Forest Agreement. But it's important to realise that the 300,000 figure was recognised by the industry as far too high and just not sustainable. The Forest and Forest Industry Council assumed a realistic figure of 150,000 cubic metres a year, well before the intergovernmental process began. 2008, that was. Thank you, 2008. Yeah, before 2009, that's when it worked. Much has also been made of the perceived reduction in specialty craft and other types of wood, especially by the furniture and boat building industry. But while the bill isn't specific on quantities, these can be fixed through negotiation and regulation. 
And there's no reason to suppose that harvesting of 137,000 cubic metres of saw logs won't yield sufficient specialty timber as part of the harvest operation. I mean, we've all heard stories in the past about some of the stuff that was put up into windrows and burnt, and the impassioned uh, discussion by Kevin Perkins in respect of the waste of a lot of that specialty timber. And we heard in yesterday's briefings from Mark Leach. Mark started as a craft timber worker at Circular Head. He worked for Forestry Tasmania, then Private Forest Tasmania, and eventually became a forest consultant. But he has never lost his interest in Tasmania's unique craft timber. He's not so much worried by the overall supply, but the cost. Nevertheless, he believes Tasmania can be a leader in providing specialty timbers and their products with proper management. And I think I got an understanding that those people who talked about the craft and furniture industry felt that there hadn't been proper management in the past, particularly Kevin Perkins, who spoke yesterday on the same subject. And he says Tasmania's timber heritage has been sold for firewood in the past. He says with proper management and proper conversion, we can do better. And I would argue, Madam President, that that's why we need a fresh start. And while we're talking about uh, yesterday's briefings, it's important to mention the contribution by Bob Annals. He made the obvious point that half the forestry industry's income has gone with the demise of guns which has had a devastating impact on communities which rely on forestry. He mentioned forest stewardship certification and its importance in the marketplace. It seems much of Tasmania's forestry industry backed the wrong horse some years ago. Mr Reynolds mentioned, as I have done, the relatively new player in the forestry debate, the internet. Apart from resource allocation, the other side of the agreement, Madam President, is the legal protection of 504,000 extra hectares. This will be in three stages under a special council of the parties involved in the Tasmanian Forest Agreement. So there's flexibility and input from all sides in Tasmania's forest debate. We're not now voting on reserves and how they'll be used. In Monday morning's briefings, we were shown a flowchart of the process for creating reserves. We've had more input through this afternoon. It seems to me to be a long process with plenty of places for input, including from Parliament. So, Madam President, as we've had enunciated, in no way are we voting on reserves, what kind of reserves, where they are, who will have access, land tenure and so on in this bill. That's a task for next year. We've all been lobbied intensively by the Tasmanian Forest Agreement members and this bill. Nowhere near the number on the uh, same-sex uh, marriage bill, but substantial nonetheless. I've tended to give more weight from those presently engaged in the forestry industry. But some arguments from other sources have been well thought out that I've taken note of. Helen Hutchinson is the daughter of a sawmiller who had timber leases and sawmills in the northeast, the northwest, and in my patch, the Tamer Valley. Her email puts the decline of our forestry industry in context. My father had timber leases and sawmills in the northeast, the northwest, as well as a sawmill in the Tamer Valley. He was a believer in a strong sawmilling industry, an industry which value added in Tasmania and which received a good price for its products. At the time, there were a large number of community-based sawmills, a plywood mill, and numbers of companies making furniture. When industrial forestry became the norm, most of the small mills and construction companies vanished. In turn, the small communities vanished, along with schools, post offices, hotels, and eventually houses. Communities were the big losers. The promise of largesse for Tasmania by the large timber companies did not eventuate. 
the price we receive for our forest resource dropped lower and lower. The Tasmanian people who owned the forest did not receive proper compensation for logging of the resource. Only the buyers and the company directors made money. At the same time, the international markets did not favour the type of timber industry we were promoting. Markets moved away from logging native timber. Businesses were affected by the high Australian dollar and wood chips were being produced more cheaply from plantations in other countries. It became uneconomic to keep doing things the old way. It is still uneconomic. It is time for a reality check. The latest inquiries into the sustainability of the timber resource have proven that we are logging at a rate which exceeds the capacity to regenerate. We cannot keep cutting forests at the same rate without losing the resource altogether. Then what do we do? Easter Island provides a graphic example of people who squandered their resources. Not only that, but we're destroying habitat for native birds and animals and some of our history at the same time, particularly the historical artefacts and the dwellings of the first Tasmanians. Some people believe that we're also threatening the health of communities through forest burning and the use of chemicals. Our community has been divided into people who believe that we can continue to extract timber at the same rate and those who can see that it is impossible. As the community became polarised, there was more tension and more distress. It is time for that to stop. Just as people in war-torn countries such as Palestine became dazed by conflict, many people in Tasmania are also experiencing this. We live in a state of limbo when we should be accepting of the scientific reports and beginning to move towards a different future. The IGA, the TFA, may not be perfect, but it has the capacity to heal if people on both sides act in good faith. That's Helen Hutchinson, Madam President, the daughter of a sawmiller. Here's part of an email from a contractor at Ryana, Fielding Logging. I believe that along with the other remaining contractors, that our last chance to remain in an industry that we have dedicated our heart and soul to is to implement the Tasmanian Forest Agreement. If the Tasmanian Forest Agreement is implemented, not only would it stop the ongoing war between the forestry and greens, but we also would gain forest stewardship certification for our wood supply. With this certification in place, the result for the timber industry in Tasmania would be similar to curing somebody with the flu. Our timber products would be sold worldwide without any conflicting interest. End of quote. 